Today on Flywire, we're going to look at uh, a quick look at five different accidents to wrap up 2023. So stick with me on Flywire. Hi, I'm Scott Purdue, and before I start today's topics or go through those those accidents, uh, I want to I want you to think about what might be common between these five different accidents. Okay, I think these all these accidents all have a common root cause, and I want you to save that to the end because we're going to talk about that. All right, the first up in our quick look is uh, the Tennessee Fly Girl, TN Fly Girl, Jenny Blaylock's accident in her Devonair in December. Here's the setup: Blaylock is a fairly low-time pilot. Bought the Debonair as a fast cross-country platform, presumably to support a real estate business or her YouTube channel, or vice versa, TN Fly Girl. It seems like uh, she vide videotaped every flight she made, and her videos seem to revolve around in certain situations uh, where, that she found herself in and her flight training. Uh, in a way, her videos have become a flight data recorder for the way she functioned as a pilot. The most glaring issue uh, that I saw was a less than robust understanding of that autopilot installed in the airplane and the role pitch trim played in the aircraft control. Ostensibly, the accident flight was a cross country to deliver the airplane for an avionics upgrade or repair, perhaps because she thought the autopilot was malfunctioning. She'd had several problems with it. The flight from Knoxville, Tennessee to Benton, Arkansas departed at 9.48 in the morning and the weather was nice. It was clear clouds, uh, wind from the south at nine knots, visibility at 10 miles. It was a nice day to fly. And the Debonair climbed initially to 2,500 feet for 12 minutes, probably to stay into the Class C airspace of the McGee Tyson Airport there on the way west. Uh, then uh, the Debonair climbed to 6,400 feet for the cruise portion of the flight. The pilot did use flight following with ATC. And keep in mind those altitudes, uh, the ADSB data shows you is GPS altitude. It's not based on pressure altitude, so it doesn't really have a huge bearing on deconfliction, altitude deconfliction. It's an approximate, within a couple hundred feet. About 31 minutes into the flight, the airplane, airplane began a series of climbs and descents. The initial oscillations varied between 6,400 feet and 5,300 feet. 29 minutes later at 1057, it entered a very uh, descent culminating at a ground speed of 143 knots during the dive and a loss of 2,100 feet. During the pitch up from that oscillation, the aircraft climbed back to 6,050 feet and then ground speed showed slowed to 84, 85 knots. Quickly after this large excursion, the earth then pitched down again on a ground track of 262 degrees, reaching a ground speed of 228 knots and that's in a descent rate of 11,900 feet per minute. She had lost control and uh, went straight in, near, nearly straight into the ground. The air traffic controller attempted to contact the pilot several times, but only received a faint communication from the pilot stating the airplane's registration, the word debonair, and an emergency decla declaration, followed by an un unintelligible word. 60 seconds later, a voice identified as the passenger transmitted a faint, unintelligible radio call. And that was it. The aircraft descended through trees, impacting uh, terrain in a hilly area, and aircraft debris was found in a fan pattern 300 feet long, cutting through the trees, uh, breached the fuel tank, scattering fuel over across a wide area. And that, uh, when that happens in fuel vapor with sparks, etc., post-impact fire. And that consumed most of the wreckage as well as some of the surrounding woods. Not much survived the crash but two video cameras were recovered and their data was not, if their data was not damaged, uh, the files will reveal what happened in the final moments of the flight. Don't expect to actually see it, but we'll see a summary of it. Uh, nothing was found that would indicate a mechanical failure pre-crash, that's in the prelim. The NTSB did note that uh, one important detail, I think this is a critical detail, and that was that the pitch trim was approximately five degrees nose down. For crews in a debonair bonanza, that's uh, very much like mine, uh, straight tail bonanza, uh, the trim is gonna be about three to five degrees nose up, depending on the airplane. Five degrees nose down is a lot of trim. If the final report can be made with data from the onboard GoPros, uh, we'll know exactly what happened. Uh, uh, 
in that flight and the accident uh, scenario, but it's going to be two years. I think we can stretch, stitch together a good lesson learned right now from this accident, and that is to know your airplane and its systems. The first thing I want to know about any autopilot I fly with is how many ways are there to turn it off, and where can I find them? There are some autopilot failures that can be insidious. For example, King Air autopilots uh, from back in the 80s and 90s uh, had a couple of them. They, uh, they experienced a spate of runaway trim issues and that led to several accidents. Electric trim, and those were all electric trim. Electric trim was not a factor in this accident, the airplane didn't have it, but a less than robust understanding of how the, how the autopilot interfaced with the trim, uh, that is a problem. And when the autopilot starts to do something weird, my first reaction is to disconnect it. In all likelihood, the excursion was due, uh, due to pilot error but it, it's always best, you know, actually, it's all, if I had an excursion, it's probably due to something I messed up with the autopilot, but it's best to disconnect it and revert to hand flying before trying to figure it out, okay? I can still hand fly the airplane, at least for now, and I think that's the best thing to do. The second accident was a Mooney M20, M20C that crashed during a go-around at Dallas in, at uh, 1748 near dark. The pilot took off from Aguila, uh, Arizona, bound for a private air park in Dallas, actually Dallas Air Park. Multiple witnesses observed the aircraft attempt to land and then go around. During the go around, the left wing dipped near vertical and an, a number of surveillance cameras caught the go around and subsequent ground impact. The landing gear was still down and the airplane ended up inverted. A post-crash fire consumed the airplane. The veteran pilot was 87 years old and apparently had just completed this trip from Arizona to Dallas nonstop. It's a flight of over five hours. I don't necessarily suspect that age was a factor, but I do suspect that there might have been some concern about fuel remaining, as well as fatigue from a long flight. Uh, anybody's gonna get tired like that, and if it's out of your sequence, especially eating, uh, have that energy, it's a problem. The pilot was in radio contact with Addison Tower and stated that he may, that it may be too dark for me, Visibility and distraction were likely, likely factors, contributing factors, and given the post-crash fire, it's obvious that there was fuel available, but possibly not enough to do a go-around and a divert, and that might have been on the pilot's mind. This is a detail that we'll never know unless the aircraft avionics recorded that information. Modern avionics do, so hopefully we'll be able to, have the, the NTSB will see that. It's gonna be again about two years before the final report is issued, and hopefully with it the docket so then we can take a closer look at what happened. But I think the takeaway of this accident is not to allow too many pressing issues to interfere with performance of the go around or any other critical maneuver for that matter. Fly the plane, don't let the plane fly you. The third accident was a Lance Air 4P, again in the Dallas area, four passenger turboprop pressurized experimental airplane that is a really fast high speed cruiser. I mean, we're talking 250 plus. Uh, speed. It's uh, at altitude. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, either piston engine or turboprop. This one was a turboprop. There were a number of issues that occurred on this flight that are interesting. It took off from Midland for what turned out to be about a 1.5-ish hour flight to Arrow Country in North Dallas. The flight was filed IFR and the pilot climbed to flight level 250 just west of Abilene. A door seal failed and the aircraft experienced a loss of pressurization. The pilot requested an immediate descent from ATC, it's not totally clear if he declared emergency when he did that, and then descended at 10,000 feet. About five minutes after traveling at 10, uh, leveling at 10,000 feet, uh, on going, still maintaining the flight to Aero Country, the pilot noted an amber caution light for propeller RPM. Noting that the RPM was showing 1920, the pilot pulled the RPM back to 1800 and the caution light turned off. That's two things that went wrong. In the pilot's statement, uh, he, repeated, he reported that he had not previously landed at Aero Country, T-31, before, and he performed a touch-and-go landing on runway 17 to see the field. The pilot flew a normal pattern for runway 17, and when he pulled the power lever back, the ball on the end of the, throw of the uh, power lever came off in his hand, uh, and then he handed it to the, to the passenger. He continued to fly the pattern, uh, with, the, with flight idle selected. I'm not sure that quite matches his speeds. I uh, don't necessarily think that that's the way it happened, but 
That's what he said. The pilot stated that he touched down on the first 500 feet of the runway without a float or a bounce, and he immediately hit the brakes and maintained run runway center line. He attempted to move the power level lever into beta and reverse for about 10 seconds without success. And I think that's partially due because of that ball. He didn't have the ability to pull up and uh, hit that detent. He then applied maximum braking and the brakes failed, faded, and the airplane went through a perimeter fence, colliding with a moving car in the eastbound lane. Uh, I find per perception interesting in stressful situations. You know, we, you know, at least for those of us that are human, sometimes experience tu a tunnel vision effect. Sometimes this sequence of events we remember it does not match reality. And this happens whether you're in the seat or a witness. In this case, there was a witness that observed the flight and he filmed it, filmed it with his cell phone. It is, after all, the age of the video camera in every pocket. So everybody's a video recorder. The cell phone video shows the airplane touched down with a bounce about halfway down the 3,000 uh, and two foot runway. All three landing gear were on the runway and smoke from the tires uh, began shortly after touchdown, suggesting a heavy braking. And uh, I think there was about three seconds delay from touchdown to braking. The smoke continued until the airplane left the runway at the end. The airport manager examined the runway after the accident and noted that the skid marks began about 200 feet south of the midpoint of the runway and were visible for 1,300 feet, which is, that's 1,500 feet right off the end of the runway and uh, then they disappeared. The gear actually looks like it broke off uh, when it hit the curb. From the end of the runway, the Lancer broke through that perimeter fence, crossed the westbound lane of traffic at Virginia Parkway, and collided with a car on the eastbound lane. No injuries were reported, so that's a plus. Uh, you know, I'm not a fan of touch and goes in complex airplanes. Uh, there are just too many things uh, that can go wrong on a good day, especially on an airplane that requires a lot of trim. Uh, so after a, a depressurization event, a propeller overspeed, and the power lever coming apart in, 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 in his hand, all the hairs would have been standing up on the back of my neck. A nice long straight in, an on-speed descent, and a touchdown on the numbers would have been my reaction to dealing with this situation, or maybe divert to McKinney with their long runway. It's not that far away, and it's really wide too. Um, so, uh, I think the uh, one of the big lessons here is uh, is that the Lancer 4P is a really fast airplane with some unforgiving slow speed performance features. It's why pretty fast uh, uh, approach speeds. There is no time to evaluate the impact of all that of the power lever ball coming off the lever during the rush to close pattern. In other words, would you get be able to get beta? beta and put the prop in reverse to help you slow down. The recommended, recommended speeds for the airplane are 120 knots in the pattern, 100 knots threshold speed, and 85 knot touchdown. That's actually not a huge speed difference delta between a Bonanza, but it's really fast nonetheless. Uh, it is a little faster than the Bonanza. Uh, a, a quick look at the ADSB record shows that the pilot was probably close to those speeds, but with a big butt. On the first touch and go, the pilot was using a descent rate of about 1,000 feet per minute at those speeds. Seemed pretty controlled, all the, about the same. On the second pass, however, the pilot flew nearly the same ground track, but a little bit of an overshoot, with comparable speeds, but at descent rates of 12 to 1,400 feet per minute. You can't do that without a pretty steep glide path. This approach is built, this kind of approach, fast, steep, is built for a long runway and a long touchdown. On a short runway like Aero Country, things happen fast without much time to react. The variance from the pilot's report of the accident in the video is evidence that the pilot was behind the airplane. When things start stacking up on you, the best thing to do is take everything down a notch, or two or even three. Take things slower, reduce the drama and speed wherever possible, throwing a shortish runway uh, that you've never been to on top of three stressful mechanical issues and a fast airplane, well, I think that's just a, that's, that's a lot of cats to herd on short final that you've never done before at this airport. Okay, why press things? Take it all down a notch or two. Okay, number four. 
The fourth accident was a barren in Alaska. It happened just over 10 years ago, and all the others I'm talking about are fairly recent, right in this December time frame, and most of them right here in the North Texas. I include this one partially because, partly because the pilot was the same pilot that was flying the F-33A with the engine fire after takeoff in Alaska that I highlighted in a video I did just a few weeks ago. He did an excellent job and published the video, that, the one that I used, and in this accident, he, this, this accident with the Baron, he didn't make good decisions. And it was just a few months after uh, the engine failure after takeoff. Uh, oh, the pilot was leading a group of 18 planes on a sightseeing tour of remote Alaska locations. He was, uh, he was doing that when he had the Bonanza accident as well, a few months ago. I guess that was his business. This time he was flying a Baron. The big group was split into two groups of nine with separate leaders. The accident pilot took off about 10 minutes before the main groups to check the weather along the route and prepare for the landing at their next destination. 18 airplanes show up, it's gonna be busy. And parking is an issue, fueling is an issue, all that kind of stuff. A lot of coordination, I imagine. Approaching the mountain pass where the accident happened, one of the leaders of the trailing groups noted the deteriorating conditions and visibility. He heard a radio call that indicated the pass was closed due to poor weather, so he diverted. Shortly thereafter, a second group also diverted to a nearby airport because of the uh, weather conditions. The accident airplane crashed near the summit of the mountain pass at an elevation of 2,370 feet, MSL, near the area where the second group turned around. I thought that was really interesting. The pilot rated, a pilot rated witness on the ground observed the Baron flying in and out of the clouds about 350 to 400 feet AGL. Weather in the past was reported to be broken clouds at 250 to 300 feet, with overcast, overcast clouds at 350 feet, and a thin, wispy fog hanging in the trees. If you've never flown into weather like that, uh, there, you know, there's no clear definition of the ground. Frankly, it's like flying into a sock. Pretty tough to avoid the rocks, in my view. Well, the final report uh, probable cause was the pilot continued uh, visual flight into instant meteorological conditions followed by ground impact. I, I don't know what else there is to say here. Um, with the engine failure on takeoff, after takeoff in the Bonanza, the pilot reacted perfectly to his situation but beyond his control. On this flight, the same pilot ostensibly led time pressures, cloud his judgment in a catastrophic way. And it was totally within his control. It's, it's very sad. Number five, <clears throat> the fifth accident, fifth accident is a shocker. It's a, a what WTF. The prelim isn't out yet, and uh, if there's good stuff there, I'm going to update this accident in a follow-on video. Um, this happened just a few miles from Flywire's New World Headquarters 2.0, where we are right now. Uh, he flew right by our house uh, about two miles. As a matter of fact, uh, my airport was one of three the pilot, pilot flew by on his way to the crash and uh, in the median of Highway 80 at Forney, Texas. He was getting, he's going back to Mesquite, and he was pretty close. Any one of those airports would have made a f this flight a non-event. We wouldn't be talking about it. Um, the flight of this Piper Turbo Aztec originated at Mesquite, as I said, on the east side of Dallas, and the pilot was attempting to return there when it appears that he ran out of fuel. The ADSB record of the flight showed a five hour and 11 minute flight on what looked like a sensor sortie to gather data or photography, I'm not quite sure. From this picture of the airplane, there's a, a sensor pod underneath. I would imagine that even at economy cruise, this pod would have developed uh, enough drag to significantly impact the fuel burn of the airplane. The POH, for this type of airplane has an eco cruise of about 24, 24 inches at 2200 RPM using 26.8 gallons per hour. There are others that are available too, but you know that particular one uh, at those altitudes that he was at comes in pretty close to the 137 gallons of usable fuel on a stock airplane. The, there are tip tanks as an option that add another 40 gallons of fuel capacity, but it's unknown whether the, the, that, this aircraft was so equipped. So five hours and 11 minutes, high fuel burn, pretty close to having no fuel at all. The pictures of the airplane indicate the two blade props were bent back 30 to 40 degrees, 
from the distance of the camera, you can't quite tell if the engine was making power on impact. You have to see a, a closer shot of the, of the props or they were just uh, uh, windmilling. Don't, don't really see it. On the face of it, it seems like the accident is probably a fuel star starvation accident. And I'm expecting the prelim report will shine, shine some light on that, okay? Right now, I'm gonna go with that theory. We'll see what the facts say. One thing that can be said in favor is this, of this pilot is that he did, or his she, did a very good job of putting the airplane down on the median without injury to anyone. Frankly, I call that a win, although getting there to do that is the problem. <laughs> on the good bad scale, running out of gas is never a good thing. So what do you think the common thread running through all these accidents is, okay? There are probably a couple of different ones, actually, that can, the common knowledge that can be tied together here. But from my perspective, the common thread that led to these accidents is that each pilot did not have any boundaries, okay? That related specifically to the accident. If, if you, you, you've got to have, if you've got to have a bucket to we're going to categorize, categorize, categorize these, maybe uh, most folks would think of aeronautical decision making as that category. I think it's more accurate to say that none of these pilots had appropriate boundaries, and that doesn't really fit into ADM, in my opinion. When I was in FNG and the Air Force, uh, quite a few of us uh, would, be ta would talk about emergencies and accidents, would review things and situations, all in an attempt to learn from others' mistakes. What was the situation they found themselves in? Uh, what were the considerations that I need to make sure I need to pay attention to so that I don't end up as a smoking hole in the ground? Okay, that was my mindset when I was flying F-4s. In the early days of the F-16, I remember one year where they lost the equivalent of a whole squadron of airplanes. As I said, I, was flew, I flew F-4s and we lost quite a few compadres uh, when I was flying the airplane. Risk was high on, and on everyone's mind. Essentially, you had to develop an additional sense, I don't know, a subroutine operating in the background, judging what you were doing and comparing it with an associated risk level, you know, uh, some situational awareness uh, subroutine running <laughs> to give you uh, uh, a check on reality. I call it having the hair on the back of your neck standing up your subconscious telling you that you're about to occupy a smoking hole. And you have to develop your situational awareness to the point where it would act as a check on your behavior, that this or that action is a bad idea. And it would be best to knock it off and do something different, okay? Take it down a notch, et cetera. Uh, perhaps you need, uh, I don't know, perhaps you need imagination to preserve the outcome of a bad situation, uh, like leaving the autopilot on uh, when uh, control start, when it starts operating. Uh, if it's doing anything more than a 50 foot devi deviation, maybe even less than that, I won't let it go that far, I'm gonna disconnect. Much less 2,000 feet, or getting distracted and a go around and losing control of the airplane close to the ground. When flying an airplane, you simply must learn to compartmentalize and focus on the task at hand. It is the near rocks that are gonna kill you. Prior planning could also be a big help, probably in both these cases. Screaming at the ground in a fast airplane on short final like that Lancer on an unfamiliar runway is a recipe for disaster at any time. Add in three major mechanical issues and maybe it's time to go someplace with long runways. Take it down a notch. Be very methodical about each and everything you do. When a lot of different things start happening, you don't have time or brain bites left to uh, handle normal stuff much less have all this stuff on your mind and then pick up on subtle mistakes. Don't bet the farm on your brakes. Adamantly opposed to scud running. I can't say I've never done it, but I did realize my error and I don't do it anymore. I, I have, have the judgment to admit that scud running is not actually an option. The odds aren't good that you're gonna get a good bounce when you hit the ground. And the odds are higher when you're getting squeezed closer to the ground or lose control when you get in the clouds, hit somebody else, etc. As far as pushing your gas, the hair begins to stand up on the back of my neck when I have an hour's fuel left. Yeah, I do have a story on this one and maybe I'll tell it sometime. In the meantime, learn from my mistake and this fellow's mistake. Being a superior pilot means you use your head to avoid situations where you don't have to demonstrate your superior pilot skills. For my part, I think of all, all of this stuff comes down, every one of these accidents comes down into that 
into the heading of airmanship. ADM is closely related, but these boundaries we're talking about are all about head work, okay? And they have little to do with the pilot's skill level per se. I think we all need to keep working on our airmanship, on our head work, how we think about the flying, the flight, the progress, you know, how it's progressing, et cetera. So I got a scenario to run by you. And leave me your comments and, uh, and down below, see what you think. You're headed for a VFR only airport. It's pretty late, it's dark, it's nighttime. It's hard to pick up on the runway and it's daylight, much less dark, you, can, you can't really see it very well. There aren't any steer points, no approaches. You get, so you get there after dark and how do you do it? How do you, how, do you like to keep your GPS steering to the airfield? Maybe you put it in the runway heading you using OBS. Maybe you just wag it. And remember, it's very dark, you're out in the country. The stars are out as well and, and let's put a bright moon right in your face, right about here. Uh, about 11, 10 and 11 o'clock. Low in the sky. What do you do? At what point do you go around when you don't see the runway? What are you looking for to tell you the height above the ground? What is your decision point? What are your decisions in this situation? Let me know in the comments below. I'd be very interested in hearing. Because this, I think, that speaks directly to this uh, airmanship uh, boundary question. If you like the video, hit like and subscribe. It looks a bit like this here. And I'd also like to thank my Patreon supporters also. Appreciate you guys very much. And if uh, I'll leave a link below in the description if you'd like to support the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Flyware.